defeated. So as I was trying to somewhat prepare for this, you know, I'm trying to think of, okay, do I come up with some new snazzy Christmas message nobody's heard or anything like that? And then I started reading some other things and just things weren't really clicking too much. And then, you know, I sat there and I, uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, fellow that was up here, oh man, his name escapes me, sorry. <laughs> if you're watching, I'm sorry. Um, but he, uh, he went and he went to Luke chapter 2 and kind of stole a lot of my thunder. So some of this might be a little bit repeated, but I promise I'm not going to put on a coat of shiny lights. Uh, there's no way to upstage that. And so uh, let's just go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 2. As we hear the, the Christmas story, as it has been said. Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in his swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. <clears throat> when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went up with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered, and what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they have heard and seen as it has been told them. Let's, uh, let's come before our Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the story of the greatest gift ever given. We thank you that we have the opportunity to read this, not just this day, not through this season, but every day. We have the opportunity to share it with others, that it doesn't have to be concealed. And so, Father, we ask now as we look into your word that you would just clear our hearts and our minds, that you would speak to us this day as only you can, and that you would continue to have this joy of this spirit within our hearts each and every day. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is not going to be some big, deep theological dive into the wonders of God's Word. I'm just not trained for that. So, but I, I read this story, and, and basically I'm just going to share some observations, some things that I thought were really pretty neat as we go through it. But uh, as we started out, and what kind of got me going down this road is that... Uh, uh, a very clever young man came up to me one day. Hey, Pa, you want to hear a Christian joke? I'm like, yeah, I'm all for that. Sure. He says, yeah, okay, well, if Jesus is the Lamb of God and Mary is the mother of Jesus, could we say that Mary had a little lamb? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but then I started to think about that. And I was like, well, you know, it goes on. So Mary had a little lamb, okay. What about that lamb? His fleece was white as snow. 
We've heard that all over scripture about the robe of Christ, right? And everywhere that Mary went, the land was sure to go. I will never leave you or forsake you. So you begin to wonder how much Christian influence there is in some of these things that we just rattle off every day and never even give a, a second thought about. So that's what kind of pointed me toward this. And as I was looking at this, uh, the one thing that kind of couples with, it, with this is the uh, verse from uh, John 3.16. You know, uh, so God loved the world that he gave his only son. Unfortunately, people stop there, and we've got to continue on with that. Uh, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And we're all very familiar with that. You see it at sporting events on signs and, and all of that thing. But it's really interesting that there's a lot of really other good 316s in the Bible. This would make for a, a pretty good uh, you know, sermon series or something at one time. <clears throat> but uh, we hear all scripture is breathed out of God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That's 2 Timothy 3.16. And John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than this, is, or mightier than I, is coming, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's Luke 3.16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3.16. Let the world of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Colossians 3.16 By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. 1 John 3.16 and, uh, and so, because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Revelation 3.16. So there's kind of all these really interesting 3.16s, but there's another one that I want us to look at today in 1 Timothy. Should have had this bookmarked. And in 1 Timothy 3.16, it says... This morning, or excuse me, gotta turn my page. So, First Timothy three sixteen says, "Great indeed, we confess this is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaiming among the nations, believed in on the world, taken up in glory." And as I looked at that, and I rolled it around in my head. There's the Christmas story that's all wrapped up in that 316. Uh, it talks about the mystery of godliness. And we need to have a, a better understanding of what, when they use the word mystery here, I mean, we think of mystery, we think of, you know, don't think of Scooby-Doo and the mystery machine or anything like that. It's not what we're talking about. Um, and uh, in the New Testament, it refers to something which is hidden and has now been revealed. So uh, we see this all through Scripture. Uh, there's all different people who uh, experience this. So you think of Moses in the burning bush. You know, that was an epiphany of God. Uh, we think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, the, the fellow that was in the fiery furnace. Um, you know, and, and it keeps going on and on uh, of all these different mystery uh, appearances of Christ that has not been revealed. But then, now... So the mystery of the glory of God, which is seen by many people through history, uh, it, it comes to its uh, uh, fulfillment in this baby in the manger, in, in the Christmas story. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, as we, as we dwell upon this, as we think about this, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, this, it's not just, you know, it, it's a, reveal, a revealment of, of such magnitude, of such, you know, immense proportions that, you're looking at this little baby in a manger, and it's the savior of the world. This is the individual who is going to come and sacrifice himself, who's going to come and take away your sin, my sin, all those who believe upon him. It's all being revealed at this point. Um, and then there's, you know, as, we, as you look at those verses, as I looked at the commentators and stuff, there's kind of a, a split on how they, they look at it. Um, some think that this was an early hymn or a creed of the church, 
which it could be. Uh, that's kind of why you see it kind of offset in the poetry form there in your Bible. Uh, you can hear the rhythm in English, manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in the glory. So from the get-go, they, they've disagreed about this basic structure, the commentators of this poem, Confession. Uh, some have argued that it's strictly chronological. Uh, you can see very clearly that there are six different lines. They believe that it's moving from the incarnation to his baptism by the Spirit to being seen by angels in his life, then preached on, then believed in, and followed by the ascension. And that's, that's possible. I mean, it's, you know, it, it makes sense. But others have argued that there are three couplets here instead, you know, three pairs of verses. Uh, each of them is meant to contrast an earthly and a heavenly perspective. So the first couple on earth, he was manifested in the flesh. In heaven, he was vindicated by the spirit. In heaven, he was seen by angels. On earth, he was proclaimed among the nations. And on earth, he was believed on. In heaven, he was taken up in the glory. So, you know, that's all possible also. You know, it's, uh, you know, it just depends on how you want to look at it, how you want to interpret it uh, to your best understanding of what God leads you to see. But I think there's, you know, I, like I said, I think there's the Christmas story that's in there. And as we look at it, he says, uh, it begins with, he was manifested in the flesh. And we go back to Luke in our Christmas story. Uh, verse 6, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. It kind of coincides. You can kind of see the matchup. And we're going to kind of run down a little rabbit hole here. Um, you, when it talked about, you know, there was no room for them in the inn, you sit there and you think about it, it's like this wasn't by chance. All these events, going to be registered, getting on the donkey, coming through, coming to an inn. There's no room at the inn. Let's go to the stall. You know, we got to find some place she's going to give birth. This was all by design. This wasn't chance. This was God's will being played out. And I'm kind of a what if guy. It's like, well, what if he it didn't happen that way? What if, you know, uh, think about it with your own children. You want to give them the best of everything. This is God's son, right? God who has <laughs> unlimited resources, unlimited power, complete sovereignty. Why didn't he be born in a palace? He's the king of kings, right? What, happened, what would happen if it, it didn't pan out this way? What happened if, you know, he was raised in, in the palace and surrounded by, you know, all the glories and riches of this world could give? Well, for one thing, you know, it's not about, in a sense, you know, I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to remember my notes. Um, the thing is, is, is when every morning or every Sunday morning, when I come here, I hear you people come in. It's the greatest joy hearing the laughters in your voice, the cheers, the hugging, the hello. It's about relationship. And that's what God is about. That's what he's concerned about, relationship. That's why we have this baby in the manger, because it's the closest relationship God could ever have with his people outside of glory. He came from glory to be with his people in this fallen wreck, wreck of a world. So it's about relationship. And so think of if, if Jesus was born in a palace. You think about the woman who had the sickness and touched his robe. You think about Lazarus. You think about Mary and Martha. Would, would these people have even access to him? I can barely see the president of my company unless I make an appointment. I can't, I doubt if I ever see the president of the United States. But here, you want, you know, the king of the Jews, what, the, these common people had access to him. They had relationship with him, which I don't think would have happened if he wasn't born in a manger, if he didn't walk amongst his people. So, the first correlation was manifested in the flesh. We see, you know, born in a manger. Uh, next, we see vindicated by the Spirit in verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And I always find that kind of interesting that here's this glorious you know, display, and they're afraid of it. 
You know, we sit there and we see the fireworks and we're like, ooh, ah, you know, and all this stuff. And then here, this thing just happens before them and they're afraid. Um, so vindicated um, might be sitting there. How does that correlate? Uh, well, uh, one of the definitions of vindica vindication of being vindicated uh, is to show or prove to be right, reasonable, or justified. And so we see that with the angels. They came, uh, the angels of the Lord appeared before them and said, look, you know, a Savior has been born. This is true. This is right. Uh, your Savior, your, uh, your uh, salvation has arrived. And then we move on, seen by angels. Verse 13, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace amongst those with whom he is pleased. <clears throat> Next, it talks about being proclaimed among the nations. Verse 15, And when the angels went away from them into the heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And all who heard it wondered what the shepherds told them. And then it goes on to believe on in the world. Verse 19, But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, and has been told them. Now I know it talks about going up to glory. I didn't see a, <laughs> a connection there. But... You know, it's interesting that you look at these, these six lines, and you can see the Christmas story. It, is, oh, it just amazes me, the connectedness of Scripture, how you read one spot and you can connect it to something else, and there's just this flow that just goes through, to and fro, and it's just a really uh, an interesting thing. But so we see all this, and, um, you know, I have to ask, we begin to ask ourselves, so... Um, you know, what does this mean to me? What does this have to do with me? What, what do I take away from this? Um, one thing you take away is that, you know, uh, all Scripture speaks about who God is. And so as we look at these lines, we can begin to see who God is. Manifested in the flesh, God is the Creator. You know, you have all been knit together in the womb by God. We seem to think that we have, you know, uh, we're in control of our families, of, our, of, of ourselves. It is God who knits together in the womb, not us. We're just tools. You know, you can have a, a shed full of tools of every tool known to man, and it doesn't do any good unless there's a directing hand behind them. A chainsaw can't drop a tree, not by itself. You know, so, you know, we see God as, you know, being the creator, uh, sovereignty. Vindicated by the Spirit, God is righteous. God is just. Seen by the angels. This one shouldn't be hard to do. Well, you know, it's part of our confession. God is a spirit. He's holy. Proclaimed uh, on in the world. He is the way, the truth, and the light. Taken up into glory. He is the king of kings, the lord of lords. He is he who sits on the throne and rules over all. So what does this story have to say to us? What does it say to me? What should we take away from it? Well, as I try to pull that all together... I, uh, I, I found that Mary did it best. We find this in Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 46, and it's Mary's song of praise. And it goes, and Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on to all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for all those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with, with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. This is what Mary had to say about the child she was carrying. This is what she had to say about the gift God given to her. This is what she has to say about the gift that was given to us. It's no small thing to sit there and, and ponder day after day how we don't even think about this. 
how we are so distracted, uh, angry, upset, whatever, that you know we don't ever sit there and ponder these things. And so every time I read that line about how she pondered these things in her heart, just think as she's watching Christ grow up before her eyes, almost hit it, almost had it, <laughs> um, that she's pondering these things. And, and it's a lesson for us. It's, you know, what, it's, it's the thing we take away from this Christmas story, that it, it's about a gift. And I find that this world does not know how to receive a gift. Uh, Phil I trained, you know, we got his kid a little Christmas present and got them something. And, you know, and he's like, I go, here you go, Andrew, and stuff. He goes, oh, oh well, I haven't gotten out and got you anything yet. I said, Andrew, it's a gift. Don't go get me nothing. This is a gift. If you feel that you have to go get me something in, in, in return, then this is no longer a gift. So God came to us, not that we could ever match his gift, but he doesn't come and sit there and say, okay, I gave you a Savior. This is what I need. He doesn't ask that at all. He says, here is my son. I'm going to offer him up. He's going to offer himself up for all of you. No strings attached. There's nothing you can do to outdo me. You can't outgift me. There's no return policy on this. It's going to happen, and he gives it to us. So that's, that's what she saw and, and as she goes through this, this wonderful, it's called the Magnificent. Um, you know, it, it just describes the child that she carries, and, and, and she knows what's about to come. So in a, a real simple way of just wrapping this all up, I guess we could just sit there and say that, Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to be into your word, to explore thoughts and ideas that uh, we hope was led by your spirit. We ask that, Father, that uh, as we go about our lives in the next couple of days, celebrating this event, it is a celebration of how you came into this world how you walked among your people, how you uh, cast no one out, not even the little children. You said to suffer them unto you, that we all belong to you, that we are all your creation. We are, are so thankful for the gift that you've given to us. We ask that uh, you would just uh, be with us as we travel, as we go to our homes, as we look forward to uh, our vocations that are coming to later the week, that uh, we would never lose the joy uh, of understanding this great gift that we would continue to have that before our thoughts and our desires at, at all times and to understand uh, the, the true meaning of, of what you have done uh, this evening and as we celebrate tomorrow. So Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity to be together as your children and your family. And so Father, we ask now that you would just continue to be with us as we go about our lives, as we wait for that great reunion uh, as we continue as we uh, leave this world and enter our home and so we praise you and thank you for this all in Jesus name amen